أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحابته ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحابته ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله في قراءة for people that could tell the difference some people aren't used to hearing Warsh uh, although I, th I think Imam Warsh his Qira'ah is getting more uh, recognition because of some really good uh, reciters from the east that are starting to recite with it but uh, Imam Warsh عنه, was uh, from Egypt and he was a student of Imam Nafi' who was the Muqri of al Madina. And he actually led the prayer for 60 years in the Prophet's Masjid. He was a teacher of Imam Malik. Imam Malik actually is considered from the Qurra, from the scholars that took and uh, were, were uh, masters of the Qira'ah. -ah. But uh, Imam Nafi was, uh, he was a black man and he was also noted for his, what they say, du'aba. Kanat fihi du'aba. He, he liked to joke, but when it came to the Qur'an, he was um, extremely serious. And he also, uh, he, it was noted that he had a scent of misk that people could smell when he spoke. It really came out of his mouth. It smelled like misk. He had two major students, one. And the qira'at, there are seven Mutawatir, Qira'at Mutawatir. And these can be read in the prayer canonically. And basically, the only ones that we use now uh, are in the Muslim world are the uh, Qira'at of Imam Nafi' and Asim and uh, Abu Amr, which is used in, uh, in Sudan. Um, but m most countries now read with. Uh, Asim and Imam Hafs was the student of Imam Asim. So you have the Qira'ah and then you have the, the actual variant of the Qari. So with Imam Nafi' you have the, the two variants, Qalun and Warsh. So Imam Warsh is recited. His riwaya also has uh, the Asfahani variant and the Azraq variant. So even the the, 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 the variants take on nuanced uh, readings also. But Imam Warsh, his variant is read in almost all of North Africa with the exception of Libya, which recites Qalun, and some places in Tunis. But people like in West Africa, in Mauritania, they learn Nafi', they learn both variants. They learn Warsh and Qalun. And the Hafid is only considered a Hafid once he masters both um, variants. One of the interesting aspects of Imam Nafi's reading is Imam Malik عنه, considered it a Sunnah over the other readings. And the reason for that is that uh, Nafi, and particularly the variant of Warsh, is in the language of Quraysh. So the things that you heard. Uh, the fact that they don't use a Hamza uh, in things like Yuminun uh, and then the Mudud that are very long. Uh, Warsh has the longest of the Mudud. Um, and then also uh, the Imala um, that you hear, which is a, when, when, when the Fatha moves towards a, uh, a Kasra sound. So the uh, Imam Malik considered it a sunnah, and he also, uh, Imam Ahmad preferred Nafi' over the other 
qira'at. He was asked about the qira'at and he said, Ufadilu nafi'an wa illa fa'asim. If I'd rather have nafi' but if I can't then then Asim is the second reading. But all of them are mutawatira and the Prophet Wasallam allowed for variant readings and one of the interesting aspects of that is the fact that ikhtilaf is part of our ummah. So one of the unusual aspects of Islam is that we have without councils, without synods, without magisteria, which are the means that other religions have used to try to create unity, there is a unity in diversity in Islam that you don't find in other religions, and that's embodied in the Quran itself. The fact that there are different ways to recite the Quran, and they're all correct. And, and so Allah loves diversity, and it's reflected in His creation that He's created us with diverse colors, different languages, different uh, habits also even, and uh, clothing and all these things, but also diversity in nature. One of the aspects of modern society is homogenization, which is to make everything similar. So wherever you go, the hotels are the same. We could be in Abu Dhabi, we could be in, in Cairo, we could be in Paris. We, it doesn't matter because it's all the same. Uh, the chandeliers are bought from the same company and everything becomes homogenized. Whereas in, in, in our tradition, there's a beauty in these differences of culture and, and um, pronunciations, the way people pronunciate uh, words. And so... Um, now the other aspect, and, and I want to to mention this because I think it's an important point. The, the desire for uniformity is actually a type of, it's a sickness of the heart. You know, when people want everything to be the same, it's a sickness in the heart. And uh, Muslims that want every, all the Muslims to behave and act and look and, and uh, be the same are actually reflecting a type of uh, of illness, and that's why it's important to note this about the Quran. Um, that even in the recitation, there's difference. Uh, the the Fatiha. If you hear somebody do the different types of Fatiha, just the Fatiha alone, you would be amazed at how many ways the Fatiha can be recited. In Wars, they say Maliki Yomidin. In Hafs, it's Maliki Yomidin. It's they're completely different um, meanings. Malik and Milik. Malik is a possessor. Milik is a king or a sovereign. And so the the, the meaning is changed, but the meaning every king is a Malik and every Malik, uh, every every king is a possessor, but not every possessor is a king. So one is universal, and the other is particular. It's an aspect of the king is that he's Malik as well as milik. He not only has sovereignty, but he owns everything. And that's in, in the old understanding of a sovereign, an absolute sovereign. So they, they don't, they're, they don't, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, they're complementary meanings. Because the idea on, on, on Yom Al-Qiyamah, لِمَنَ الْمُلْكَ الْيَوم, you know, who owns everything on this day? So people, not only do they recognize the Malik, but they recognize the, the Milkiya of the Malik, you know, the, 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 that he possesses everything on the Yom Qiyam. They recognize both aspects, that not only is Allah sovereign, but he's an absolute sovereign. Because some sovereigns, you have constitutional monarchs, you have monarchs that... So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an absolute sovereign on the day uh, of judgment when everybody will recognize that. So that's important. Now, the other uh, very interesting thing about the, uh, the unity uh, in diversity as opposed to uniformity is that our religion is the only religion in the world that is a world religion in that it has many, many followers. I mean, there's sects that might have a type of unity, but it's the only religion where you can go to a masjid anywhere 
irrespective of what type of masjid. You know, it could be a Brelvi masjid, it could be a Diobandi masjid, it could be uh, a Sufi masjid or a Salafi masjid or a Maliki or a Hanafi or a Hanbali or a Zaydi or a Ibadi or Ithna Ashiri. I mean, and on and on and on. There's lots of variations of Muslims out there. But what is so fascinating is the Qibla is the same. So all those people that have these different variations of Islam, when they go to Mecca and Medina, they all face the same Qibla. They pray behind the Imam. The basic form of the prayer is the same. There's slight differences. You move your finger, where you put your hands, what you do uh, in the particulars of the prayer. There are some slight differences. But the unity is actually quite extraordinary. There's really nothing like it in any religion. Because the Jews don't all have, they can't go to, the synagogues are very different. There are synagogues where, where the men and women are mixed. There are synagogues where there's a woman who's a, the rabbi or the cantor. Or you go to churches, you might get a rock mass. You might get a very uh, stripped down type of mass. Lots of different things. But with Islam, and the reason you, you don't, and the reason for that is that Islam has inherent antibodies against changes to anything that's essential to the faith. And that is because the Prophet ﷺ put so much emphasis on the fact that the previous religions had changed their teachings. They had changed them. And so people that call for this kind of reformation of Islam today, they... they immediately red flags for Muslims should go up. People that want to change this religion that has been handed down for centuries. There's things that are wrong with the Muslims. But Islam is the same teaching. Nothing's changed. And there's differences of opinion. There's all those things. But that's part of the tradition that there's all these differences. So it's important to uh, remember that when we look, uh, because the qira'at are a very fascinating um, aspect uh, of that. And so it was really nice to hear uh, such a beautiful uh, recitation from uh, the imam. Mm. Now, the, before I go into the actual surah, uh, I wanted to give you... A, what, what would be called a heuristic tool. Uh, it's a type of tool that comes from Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi, who was a Granadan scholar. He was from Spain. Uh, really brilliant uh, scholar. His, his, uh, his tafsir, Tashil al-Ulum al-Tanzil, is a favorite tafsir of a lot of scholars. Um, and uh, there's reasons for that that are quite obvious for anybody that's ever... Uh, looked into it, but it's a very short tafsir, but for some reason he was able to pack an incredible amount of meaning in, in very, very concise uh, phrasing. But he, he basically identifies a means uh, of looking at verses of the Qur'an and understanding uh, the Qur'an. So I wanted to go over that. I wish I had a blackboard because I think it would help um, to do this, but... Um, Basically, the first thing is that the Qur'an is first and foremost a book. In fact, that's one of the names of the Qur'an, Al-Qur'an, Al-Furqan, Al-Dhikr, and Al-Kitab. Those are the four names of the Qur'an. All of the other names are considered adjectives, whereas those are the substantives that identify what the Qur'an is. The Qur'an is... Uh, for, there's difference of opinion, but the dominant opinion is from the, the qara'a, which is a reading or a recital. And the Arabs, the Arabs, one of the most important aspects of the Arabic language is the vastness of it and the ability to say many different things with the same words. But the Arabs use qara'a to mean to recite something like aqra'uhum minni as salam recite to him my greeting. So it doesn't mean read to him. It literally means just say, As-salamu alaykum, fulan yusallamu alayka. So and so says, salamu alaykum. So you can say that in Arabic. So when Jibril said, iqra, read or recite, 
the Prophet ﷺ negated both aspects because on the one hand, he was not a Qari, he was not somebody who, who read, but nor was he a Rawi, he didn't re recite poetry, he didn't do what the Arabs did in their gatherings because a lot of Arabs memorized massive amounts of poetry and they would be able to uh, read from that poetry or recite it by rote. So the Prophet negated, he said, Ma'ana I, I don't know how to read, which is one meaning of it. But the uh, Jibreel السلام, said, Iqra again, uh, you know, he, he pulled him so hard until he said, الجهد, like that he thought his sides were going to crush into, he did that three times. And then the revelation begins, Iqra bismi rabbika الذي khalaq. So the, the revelation begins with Iqra read or recite and it's it's interesting because reading has different elements to it one of the elements of reading is to uh, just the, the the actual act of reading is quite an extraordinary thing the ability to read signs and this is a lot of interest now in in, in Western um, universities is on semiotics and signs. There's a, in fact, a lot of philosophy now has been reduced to studying signs. Uh, they're very fascinated by this, the ability to read signs, but also to create uh, schemas out of the world, that when we see things, the mind naturally puts things together. That's why we're so prone to conspiracy theories, because conspiracy theories are the way the mind deals with sometimes random events or events that don't really make sense. We try to make sense out of them by creating things that might not necessarily be there. They might be, but they might not necessarily, and oftentimes they're not. But the mind is very good at that, and it's good at reading and interpreting. So when you read something, uh, you, you can read it on a lot of different levels. And obviously... The, the iqra that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling is a new type of reading or a renewed type of reading because uh, you know, that this is something that your fathers had not been uh, aware of. So this, re this new reading, the qira'a, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about is the idea of reading signs of reading signs. And so the Qur'an, the definition of the Qur'an is that it's a reminder, it's a furqan, it's a standard or a criterion by which you judge between truth and falsehood. It's a, uh, a recital and a reading, so it's both recited and it's read as a book. And what's interesting about that is orality and literacy are the two ways that human beings have existed throughout history. Everybody enters into the world in a state of orality. In other words, they're in a state of uh, being uh, unable to read, illiterate. And, and, and that's the primary mode of human beings. Literacy is something that's acquired, and it's actually acquired with, with difficulty. It's not easy to become literate. Um, you have to understand words and then you need to learn signs. And if you look at children, there are a lot of ways that children can have problems with reading. But reading is actually very miraculous. People don't think about reading very much. But reading is very miraculous. The fact that we can take symbols and that have sounds, uh, phonemes, put them together and create these um, dyadic uh, sounds that then generate unbelievable meaning. The amount of meaning that can be generated with the 28 letters of the Arabic alphabet is beyond belief. Really. It's, it's, it's quite difficult to fathom. And every language has immense sophistication. Even the most primitive languages, in fact, some of the most primitive languages are the most sophisticated languages. So there's no... It's like DNA. It just doesn't get simple. The deeper you go, the more complicated uh, it gets. And so the, the, uh, the Qur'an has all of these elements, and then it's a proof of the veracity of the Prophet Sallallahu teaching, but if the ulama define it as being 
something that is mu'jiz, that it incapacitates, it's muhabihi, it's revealed ila Muhammad to the Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad, in order for it to be recited, لِلْتَلَاوَةِ وَلِلْتَعَبُّدِ Sidi Abdullah ibn Haji Ibrahim says, لَفْلٌ مُنَزِّلٌ عَلَى مُحَمَّدِ لِأَجْلِ التَّلَاوَةِ وَلِلْتَعَبُّدِ That it's something that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ in order for it to be recited and as a way of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and drawing near to Allah by following its injunctions, avoiding its prohibitions, understanding its meaning. And so when you look at, you know, if, 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 if you want uh, a definition of Qur'an, that's, that's one definition. That's the standard kind of ulama definition that you'll find in tafsir. But Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi gives an, a very simple definition that I think works incredibly well because one of the uh, important aspects of our religion is that although it's centered around the Qur'an, there is an immense illiteracy about what the Qur'an is. There are many, many Muslims that can read the Qur'an. Some read it very well, but you would... I think be astounded at the numbers of Muslims that have a, uh, a, a, a complete lack of understanding about what the book is actually about. Now I'll give you an example. If you take an average Baptist who's serious about their religion, all right, and I'm talking about Christians that are serious about it, they will have, and I'm not saying to do this with the Quran, but they will have a very dog-eared uh, Bible that's been just used over, and you'll see like stickums and cross-referencing and all these, because they go every Sunday and they have a preacher that is cross-referencing and doing, and then turn to James uh, 3.16 and they all turn to James 3.16. There's a study that goes on that is very absent in the Muslim world. You know, a serious study of the book what does this book say? Now, if you ask the average Christian what Genesis is about, and I'm talking about a devout Christian, they'll, they'll, they could tell you the plot of the book. In the beginning, God created. They'll tell you about the, Adam and Eve. They get out of exiled from paradise. They can tell you about um, you know, building the Tower of Babel. They can tell you about the flood. They can tell you all these things that happen. And they basically know the theme of that book. But if you ask Muslims, what is Surah Al-Baqarah about? What is it about? Is there a theme to it? Do you see? And the thing about the Qur'an, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran. You know, don't they think deeply about this book? Tadabbur is to take something to the end of it. You know, the dubr is what's behind. So tadabbur is to really make an effort to get to the end of something, to exhaust it to as much as you're possible to, uh, able, able to. Now the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith which is sahih and everybody I think has heard it if they've gone to Jum'ah or مَشْتَمَعَ قَوْمٌ قَوْمٌ فِي بَيْتٍ مِنْ بِيُوتِ اللَّهِ يَتْسَلُونَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَيَتَدَارَسُونَهُ بَيْنَهُمْ That no group of people will get together in a house from the houses of God reciting the book of Allah. But then it says, يَتَدَارَسُونَهُ Now, tadarus in Arabic is, uh, in sarf, it's used for musharaka, when people actually work together to understand something. What's happened in our community is we have created these, these uh, approaches to the book in which you have a group of people that are called the ulama, and they learn, and they spend a lot of time learning it, and then we go into a passive receptive mode. So people are empty, and the person comes, and they fill them up with information or something like that. And that's one way of learning. And there's no doubt, there's benefits to that way of learning. For instance, if you, grammar is grammar. There's, there's debates about grammar. But basically, grammar is grammar. You either know what a fa'il is, or you don't know what a fa'il is. But we're not going to sit around and discuss what a fa'il is. 
Like, what do you think, Zaid? Well, I think it could be, or maybe it's no. A fa'il is, there's a very specific definition to a fa'il. And then it has rulings that go with it. And then the maf'ul, you know, there's mansubat. You learn them. And there's difference of opinion about them. You can get into that. Like some things, they'll differ. Can, can, you, can that be mansub or not? And you grammarians will get into, these are when you get into the inner recesses of grammar. But generally, grammar is something that if you know it, you can teach it. And if you don't know it, you should shut up until you've learned it. <laughs> you know, it's very important. Because if you don't know what a conditional sentence is, you'll, you'll mistake what people are saying. If you don't, in the Qur'an, you know, the, the most important book for understanding the Qur'an I mean, I would say, is Mughni al-Labib, which deals with all the, the, those like the fa. There's all these different types of fa in the Qur'an. There's different types of ma in the Qur'an. There's different types of hatta in the Qur'an. And you have to work out what, which one's being used here. And they're not always clear on it. Even the mufassirun differ. And sometimes they'll say, this is the arjah, this is the dominant opinion. And other times they'll say, Allahu alam. And sometimes they'll say, yahtamil al wajhain. You know, it can, you can take it to mean both. It can have both. And there's benefit to that. There's real benefit to that. But it's important to remember that if you don't have the tools of grammar and also balagha, balagha is very important. I'll give you an example in Arabic. In Arabic, when you read the Qur'an, one of the things that Western people have that they find really problematic about the Qur'an is it's always changing. It goes from the first person to the second person to the third person, and it's disorienting for Western people because they do not have a rhetorical device that the Arabs use, which is called iltifat. Iltifat is to switch persons. And the Arabs do it for a very specific reason. They do it in their pre-Islamic poetry. And, and it's, it's a rhetorical device to cause a type of, to keep the listener's attention, to make them think about what you're saying. I used to have, I had a, a teacher, Allah yarahamuhu, Sheikh Shaybani, he was one of my favorite teachers, but he used to, when he would teach me, he would always pull on my fingers, and sometimes hard, and sometimes he would slap me, like just like he would hit me and say, did you get that? And I realized it was like the Zen master that comes around with the stick and hits the people doing the Sazen to keep them present. Because the mind wanders. There's probably some people in here already, their mind is wandering, and they're wondering, what's everybody laughing about? <laughs> because they were somewhere, they were in Fort Hood, or who knows where they were. They're thinking about uh, this, that, or the other. So it's, it's that technique in the Quran is a very important technique. It's right there in the Fatiha. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawmiddin Iyaka So it goes from Ghayba to Khatab Iyaka Na'abudu Wa Iyaka Nasta'een Ihdina So right there and the ulama say it goes from Ghayba to Hudur that you open the Quran and you you open your prayer in a state you're moving towards presence so it begins, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And it's getting, you know, you come in to, with the mercy and then the Jalal of Allah. You know, he's Rabbil Alameen, he's Maliki Yawmi Deen. And then Maliki Yawmi Deen, I'm going to meet him, Iyaka. The presence is there. So that is iltifat in the Quran. It's that technique is a device that the Arabic language uses to pull you in to presence, to bring you back. And so if you don't know these things, uh, the Qur'an is a very difficult read. And another aspect of the Qur'an is just the Arabic language. I had another teacher, Sheikh Abdurrahman, who used to say, 
العلم بحر بغوص الماهرين فيه تلف اليواقيت والمراجين that knowledge is an ocean and when people that understand it swim in it when they swim in it تلف اليواقيت فيه والمراجين they find pearls and coral and لكنه غير مأمون تماسحه but the sharks and the crocodiles and the, those things that will eat you up, you're not safe from them if you don't know how to swim in there. وَلَيْسَ فِي كُلِّ مَوْجٍ فِيهِ دَلْفِينُ And there's not a dolphin in every wave to help you. Right? The Arabs say, دَلْفِين. If you look in, uh, in uh, مُخْتَارَ Sihah, which is a short, uh, an abridged version, uh, by Ar-Razi of the Sihah, which is one of the great books. And he wrote it for beginners, and he'll have words in there, because it was the first dictionary that I really learned pretty well when I was first studying Arabic. I spent a lot of time in that. But he used to, I'd look up a word and he'd say, Ma'loom, like everybody knows it. You know, like, <laughs> I don't know it. <laughs> But if you look in this book, Mukhtar uh, Siha, he says about Duchas, he says that th- this is a fish in the ocean, uh, and yuqalu lahu delfin, it's also called a dolphin, and it says, yunaji al gharik, he saves the drowning man. Yumakinuhu min dhahrihi. You know, he puts him on his back and takes him to dry land. So the Arabs had a good uh, regard for the dolphin. And that's why he says that knowledge, it's, it, there's danger in this ocean of knowledge, and there's not always dolphins there to save you because people go astray. The Quran, everybody in the history of Islam that has gone astray went astray by interpreting verses and hadith in other than the way they should have been interpreted. Everybody. And that's why if you, if you don't know the... And Arabs think they know the Arabic language uh, because it's their language, and there's no doubt they know a type of Arabic. They're speaking Arabic, even if there's uh, broken Arabic now or there's a lot of reduction in, in, in the Arabic that's used today. But nonetheless, it's still Arabic, and many of the words that the... Uh, ancient Arabs used are still used in, in Arabia and amongst the Arabs. I mean, Egyptians use words that are Quranic all the time. Um, and even Moroccans, uh, who people would argue in the East, whether that was Arabic or not, it is Arabic. Um, and uh, once you get used to it, you actually kind of, there's some really enjoyable things about Moroccan Arabic. Um, like if a Moroccan gets mad, they say, Billati, Billati, you know. And they mean, idfa' billati hiya ahsan. You know, but they just say, billati, billati. You know, and it just means calm down in Moroccan Arabic. But it comes from that verse. You know, don't get angry. Turn the other cheek type thing. So, uh, but you, you'll find hadith. The Prophet said, la'anallahu as-sariqa yasriqu al-baydata fatuqta'u yaduhu. May God curse the thief who steals an egg and gets his hand cut off. Now, people can say, if you read that, it says if you steal an egg, you get your hand cut off. But that's not what the hadith means. That hadith means that people start off stealing little things, like an egg, and they don't think that it's a big deal, but later on they steal something big, and they get their hand cut off. So the Prophet ﷺ used a very abridged, succinct language that had massive amount of meaning. He said, Utitu Jawami al Kalim. I was given these comprehensive words. A comprehensive word is the one that the, 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 the simplest people understand it at one level, the middle people understand it at another level, and then the Arifin and the ulama understand it at a completely different level, and all the levels are valid. And the Prophet ﷺ had that gift. So when you look at this definition of Qur'an, I think it's a really extraordinary definition of Qur'an and very useful. So if somebody asks you what the Qur'an is, you can say that 
he says all of the knowledges are contained in the Quran. And this is, we believe this. We've left nothing out of this book. And so he says, you can talk about this in, you can generalize about it, and then you can go into details. As for a, a general statement of what the Quran is, he says the Quran is da'wat al-khalqi ila ibadati lahi wa ila dhukhuri fi dinihi. That that's the definition of Quran. If you want a definition of Quran, that is the definition. It is the invitation of creation to the worship of the Creator and to enter in to His deen. To enter into the deen of His... That's what the Quran is. It's da'wah. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, he said that the Quran is ma'adabatullah. It's and ma'adubatullah also, that it is a place where one learns discipline and adab, but it's also a banquet, because the ma'duba is a banquet. It's the place you go where the Sayyid invites everybody to feast. But when you go into the Sayyid's gathering, you have to have adab. And so the Arabs use that word to indicate that it's a place of adab. The banquet is a place of adab. Now what's interesting about banquets, and this is one of the Persian poets says this, Hafil, says, if you realize that the world is God's banquet, he's brought everybody here, and this is his banquet. And he said, and you realize that you were just one of the guests how would you view everyone else? Because everybody's here by invitation of God. It doesn't matter who they are. The Jew, the Hindu, the Buddhist, the Jain, the atheist, everybody has been invited here. And their life is a full life. It's not, you know, we see people at points in time and we assume that that point in time is, is, that's all. Because most exchanges between human beings are utilitarian. I need this or I need that. that that's most exchanges with people. They're u- utilitarian. We, you know, we use people, right? And, and we honor things. If you, if you look how people treat things in their house, they treat them, they don't want to break the vase, so they'd never knock the vase over, but there's people that just bump into other people and push them out of the way. So they honor things, but humans or animals, because animals have rights as well. There's people in this culture, lawyers, that are trying to assert that animals have legal standing and that they should be able to have class action suits and you know, that people, lawyers would act on behalf of the owl or behalf of, you know, there's people that, that's a very Islamic view that we actually do believe. And we know that animals came to the Prophet ﷺ and used him as their advocate against people that were wronging them. We know that the camel complained about being given too much. And the prophet told the man to not burden the camel with more than it could bear. We know about the gazelle that complained to the prophet ﷺ that it had uh, some uh, foes in and that it hadn't finished uh, uh, suckling, which is also an indication about uh, hunting. You know, there's laws in this country, the times that you can hunt. Those are, these are very humane Islamic principles, the idea of not hunting out of season because animals have their offspring and they're taking care of them. So if you shoot the doe when it's uh, during their uh, season that they're nurturing their offspring, you, you've, you've orphaned these animals that don't have... I mean, our religion takes all that into consideration, which is quite extraordinary. So if, if you look that this is a banquet that it's an invitation, it's a da'wah. Now, what the beautiful thing about a da'wah is you have like, when you get an invitation, it says RSVP sometimes. You know, responde s'il vous plaît, like please respond. And so it's a courtesy just to say, I can't come. That's what they're asking because, you know, some they don't care, you, don't, you know, whether you just, if you come, let us know. If you don't, don't. You know, you don't have to let us know. But 
the da'wah of Allah is an honor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's not only created us and we're his slaves, but he's treated us in this I-thou relationship, to put it in uh, modern philosopher's terms. The, the idea that we are, we have dignity. لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ That we have ennobled and dignified the children of Adam. And so the way we speak to them, the way we address them, يَا يُهَا النَّاسِ Not يَا يُهَا الْحُقَرَاءَ الْحَمْقَاءَ الْغَافِلُونَ You know, you idiots, you fools. Really, it's, it's speaking to them, you know, الْإِنسَان You're something amazing, you know. I'm putting in the earth a caliph. So it's an invitation for all of creation. Meaning here, Al Alameen Ibn Abbas said that the Alameen are the, the ins and the jinn. Um, even though it contains the meaning of the world, the, 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 the Arabs have different types of plurals. So the awalam is worlds when it's not aql. It, there's no rationality there. So awalam, Allah doesn't say rabbal awalam. He says rabbal alameen. And the alameen are the ins and the jinn. They're the ones that can respond to Allah and acknowledge Allah in a way that's rational as opposed to say animals that are in submission to Allah but they don't have the cognitive understandings that human beings have. They do their tasbih and they do it, but it's not like human beings or ints or jinn. So this is a, an invitation to creation to worship Allah and enter into his deen. And then he says, but this lofty goal necessitates two things. And you have to have them. And all of the Qur'an goes back to these two things. All of the Qur'an. So the first is بَيَانُ الْعِبَادَةِ الَّتِي دُعِيَ الْخَلْقُ إِلَيْهَا وَالْأُخْرَى ذِكْرُ بُعِثْ تَبْعَثَهُمْ عَلَى الدُّخُورِ فِيهَا So the first is to clarify what that ibadah is that they've been invited to. The Qur'an is there to clarify what it is. So it's دَعْوَةَ الْحَقْ إِلَى عِبَادَةِ اللَّهِ They're being called to worship Allah. So the Qur'an is going to clarify what that is. And, and make it clear to human beings what exactly they're being asked to do. And then the other is to mention the bawa'ith, those things that will engender a desire to enter into ibadah. So, and this is, you know, it's interesting. There are certain things that are left, there are certain things that Allah tells you to do and then doesn't tell you why. And then there's other things He tells you to do or not to do and tells you why. So the Qur'an tell, explains to you in some instances why you're not supposed to do this. In Nuhurijsun, min amr shaitan it's an evil thing. It's from the, the works of shaitan. It's going to spread dissension amongst you. Don't do it. Ashtanibuhu, avoid it. So it tells you. And then there's other things like the khinzir. It just doesn't tell you. You can talk about, well, it's because it has trichinosis. Well, now you can uh, eliminate that uh, uh, so there's Reformed Jews that say we can eat pork now because in those days, whereas Muslims, as far as I know, we might have some Reformed Muslims around. But as far as I know, I don't know of any Muslims that will, uh, will say that. You know, I, I haven't met one yet. But, you know, there's all kinds of amazing things out there. Um, so, but I, I haven't met that. But uh, there are certain things that Allah doesn't tell you. In fact, one of the ulama said that the reason pork is prohibited is because it's the best tasting meat. <laughs> That's, I read that once in a tafsir. I was like, how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> because the Arabs, they say, Aladdu shayma hurima. You know, the sweetest thing is the thing that's prohibited. It's a jahili idea. <laughs> you know, people like to do things they're not supposed to do. You know, you naughty boy. Like that so the, uh, there are things that Allah 
told you, and then there's things that he doesn't. And one of the wisdoms behind that is that if everything was explained to you, you, you might only do them for those reasons. But there are certain things you don't know, and then you do them for the sake of Allah only. So there's no musharaka in your, in your intention. There's, there's not like, oh, the prayer's good because you can stretch and exercise. So some people will do the prayer because, well, it's like stretching and exercise. And I've heard people say that. I heard somebody once explain to me that the reason you do sajda is to discharge electricity in your brain. They t seriously, and they were very serious about it. And they said, that's why. Because in Maliki fiqh, it's actually preferred to pray on, on uh, earth or on uh, straw, like straw matting. And, and he, he was actually arguing that it'll discharge if it's earth or straw matting. Whereas if it's on uh, you know, polyester, it'll make it worse. Something like that. You know, but somebody could be doing that, just doing sajda to discharge. They think that it's a good thing to do. And so there's things that Allah doesn't tell you, but there's other things because people are motivated by, by what? Two things. No, no, no. It's two things. Motivate people. What motivates people? Rewards and punishments. Right. And, uh, and that's why real ethics, you know, Kant, who was a German ethicist, talked about autonomy and heteronomy, that, that real ethics is when you have autonomy, that you're, you're doing things from yourself, you're being good from yourself. Heteronomy is when you're being good because you're afraid of somebody else. And that's why even though it's, the hadith is not, you know, some say it's fabricated, but the meaning is a beautiful meaning. You know, Ni'm al abdu suhaib you know, what a blessed servant is Suhaib al-Rumi. Even if there was no fire, he would not disobey Allah. You know, in other words, he wasn't doing what he was doing out of fear of punishment. And there are servants that worship Allah because he's, he's worthy of worship. That, that's the highest level. Imam al-Ghazali talks about different reasons why people worship. He said there's ibadatul abid that are afraid of being punished. And then there's ibadatul tujar, uh, they want a reward. Like if you do this, you'll get this. And there's people that really get into that. Oh, you get a hundred, then they add them up and have calculators and work out. Like what, seriously, there's people that do that. It's amazing. But there are people that do that. But then he said there's ibadatul ahrar. The, the, the servitude of the free people that have entered into this contract with Allah because they, 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 they want to worship Allah out of love of Allah because Allah is worthy of being worshipped which is the highest. So this is what he says and then he says that as for the ibadah of Allah so okay the first thing is the definition of the Quran. The Quran is the Qur'an is the da'wat al-khalq ila ibadatillah, right? It's inviting creation to worship Allah and then to invite them to enter into this deen, a transaction with Allah, this deen where you do things and Allah reciprocates. So he says the ibadah is divided into two types, usul al-aqaid, which are the foundations of what you believe, and ahkam al-a'mal, and then the things that you do. So our ibadah is based on two things, belief and action. If, if you want to use a university or a high school metaphor, you have lab, right, where you learn the theory, and then you have lab. So you do the theory, and then you have the lab. You, you learn the theories about how things interact, and then you go into the lab and you see it. Our dean has theory, which is things that you need to learn and understand and believe. And, and one of the things about learning these things is they clear up so much trouble for you. Once you learn, I mean, I'll give you an example. Muli al-Arabi, one of, one of the... Uh, really interesting scholar. He lived about 200 years ago in, in Morocco. But he said that he had read the Qur'an 
from a perspective and had a realization that the Quran was really challenging human beings to take responsibility. And so he said that anything that happens is really from our own selves. That you, you can't change anything in reality other than yourself. Because if you try to change the world and you haven't changed yourself, you just make a mess of it. Really, you make a mess of it. And there's all these people that want to change the world, but they're so disturbed in their own being. Like the man who's fighting for, to, to uh, eliminate pornography and he's addicted to pornography. This happens. People are contradictions. There's people that uh, are fighting to eliminate domestic violence and they go home and beat their wife. It's amazing. We, we read the same newspapers. Right? This stuff happens all the time. It's, it's so amazing, the contradictions that people carry around in them. And so he said that if you read the Quran from that perspective, you know, God does not change a people until they change within themselves. Muslims want change in the Muslim world, but they're not willing to change themselves. Right? Really. We wonder why we're being treated the way we're being treated in so many places. But if you look at our societies, look how far we've fallen just as societies. So if you read the Quran, the, the most dangerous aspect of the Quran is it is criticizing us. The Quran is a critique. You can read it and it talks about the kuffar and all the... It's talking about... Read the Quran. It's talking about us. It's saying, where are you? Are you one of these people? Are you one of these people? Are you one of these people? It's talking to you. Now, you can read it and think it's all talking about these other people, and I'm fine. <laughs> and there's people that read it like that. But that's, if you take the Quran seriously, the Quran is a deeply troubling book. It's a troubling book. It's not, it's what... Houston Smith said, it's not a book you want to curl up at night with. And I think that's a really good description. And he wasn't making light of it at all. He's saying, this book is going to challenge you. It's not for entertainment, the Quran. It's, it's not a book for entertainment. So he says that it's to learn these that, that the ibadah has aqaid, beliefs, and then it has ahkam. It has rulings that relate to how you behave. So it has how you perceive the world, which is called right thinking, and then how you act in the world, which is right doing, right behavior. Istiqama in understanding and istiqama in belief. Now you have to have istiqama in your understanding in order for your actions to have uprightness. You can't have, if your actions uh, are not based on your beliefs, the al-amru bila ilm junoon. Al-ilmu bila amal junoon, wal-amru bila ilm la yakoon. You can't act without knowledge. If you look at, if you're building a house and something's wrong, the, the walls aren't matching up, you have to go back to the measurements. You have to go back to the theory behind the house. I mean, every architect knows that. And that's why it's so important. If you look at the first generation, they are the blueprint for behavior. That's why we go back to them. If we look, one of the most challenging things about the Quran, and this is a radical belief about Muslims, Muslims are defeated from their own actions. And if you read the early seerah, all of it, that's what they were told again and again and again. If you're defeated, it's because of your own actions. Don't worry about those people. And this is why when the Prophet ﷺ said that you should go on to al umam kama akaratu ira qasatiha, that the time is coming when the nations, meaning the Jews and the Christians, would gobble you up like people come to a plate and devour and consume the plate. They said, is it because we're few? Look at the question. They didn't say, is it because they're many? They weren't asking about them. They were saying, what's wrong with us? 
Because they had tarbiya nabawiya. They had prophetic training. They knew how to assess the situation. So their question was, Amin qillatin yawma idin ya Rasulullah? That's a logistical question. Problems with the Muslims are never logistical. Bel, antum kathirun. Oh, you're multitudes. You're multitudes. Warakinnakum ghutha. But you're like floth. You're like the froth. There's no substance there. Warakinnakum ghutha ka ghutha is Just like a, a torrent, like when you have a, a torrent come down, like a flood, it creates a froth. He said, that's what you're like. You're like that. It looks like it's substantial, but when you reach out, there's, no, there's nothing there. And then he said something amazing. He said that your enemies would lose awe of you. Which is amazing. Because there was a time when the whole world was in awe of the Muslims. The whole world. They were in complete awe of them. They were worried more about Muslims attacking them. They weren't even thinking about attacking Muslims. They were worried about Muslims attacking them. They were fortifying their cities out of fear that their cities would be conquered by Muslim armies, not the other way around. And then he said something amazing also. He said that the, the disease that Muslims had would be wahan. Wahan. Now, wahan is an interesting word because in Arabic it means dhu'af, like weakness. But uh, Abu Hilal al Askari, who wrote a book called Furuq al Logha, says the difference between weakness, which is dhu'af, and weakness, which is wahan, is that wahan is the type of weakness that somebody who's strong, but they're acting like a weak person. So they have power, but they're behaving as if they were powerless. And what was that weakness? Love of material things and distaste of sacrifice, of, of resistance, which death, just sacrifice. People don't want to sacrifice. So the Prophet identified the problem in the heart. That's where he took everything. And that's what the Quran, if you, if you understand the aqidah of the Muslims, it's a very, very empowering aqidah because it's, it's telling you the problem is not outside of yourself it's in you and if you address the problem you will see that things change around you that is real empowerment because when you're disempowered when you're told that oh the problem is they're too strong or oh you can never do that you don't have enough money you don't have you, it's all outside you're powerless there's nothing you can do but when you're told it begins inside you. That's, that's something I can do. I can't make this army out there disappear, but I can change what's in myself. And then Allah will make the army out there disappear. I mean, this is the Quranic narrative. People, I don't think they, they, I don't think Muslims read it anymore and think about it because a hundred years ago, uh, Shakib Arsalan wrote a book explaining why the Muslims had been defeated and it was all from this perspective and it was one of the most widely read books in the Muslim world and everybody accepted it. Now nobody ever talks about that. It's all outside. It's, you know, and I tried to explain this once to a man, I won't say where he was from, but he said, it's all the kuffar. They did this whole thing to us. And I said, no, 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 they're a symptom. It's like a parasite on a weak body. You know, when you're, when you have a compromised immune system, you're susceptible to sickness. If your immune system is strong, then you can ward off. He said, no, 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 it's kuffar. And, and then I quoted him several verses of the Quran, and finally he said, you know, that you're right. The Quran does say that. But the kuffar took us away from the Quran. <laughs> you know, so at that point, I gave up. Now... So the bawa'ith, those things that engender this desire to worship Allah and to enter into this state are targhib and tarheeb. Yuraghibu, you know, to make targhib, make you desire something. Raghba and rahba. 
irhab, to create some fear in you. It's an unfortunate fact that the, these hack translators translated terrorism as irhab because it's not irhab, it's, it's, a, it's the wrong word for it. Though irhab is a beautiful Quranic term and uh, it shouldn't be used like that, you know. But unfortunately, we have a lot of, um, uh, you know, these newspapers, like they call fundamentalists usuliyun, which, which is, means that you're, you studied usul al-fiqh. I mean, you can't, you know, you have to be careful with words. Just call them fundamentalist. I mean, there's a whole bunch of <laughs> words that Arabs use that aren't from Arabic, you know, or mabda'iyun or something, mabda'iyun, I don't know. But not usuliyun, please. Now, here, and this is what I wanted to get to because this is very important. All of the meanings of Quran, all of the meanings of Quran are seven. Everything in the Quran falls under one of these seven categories. The verse will either be about one of these or will have more than one in it. But you, everything in the Quran can be read from these seven. This is the heuristic tool that I'm giving you before we go in to the chapter, which I'm not going to finish because it's, it's a very, uh, I mean, Yasin is, you know, it's, 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 uh, there's just so much in there. But um, I think this will be useful for you in your study of the Quran, and that's why I wanted to share it with you because it's helped me a lot. The first is ilm al is knowledge of Allah's rububiyyah, that Allah is Rabbul Alameen. So there are verses in the Quran, either part or the whole verse, which indicates rububiyyah. It's telling you that Allah is Rabb. And Rabb is, most of the ulama say that it's from uh, Rabba, I mean it's, it's from Rababa, but you have ishtiqaq, which the, the, the last letter in the word uh, can be replaced with other letters. So the, the meaning of Lord is murabbi. It's the one that nurtures you. It's the one that takes you through stages of numu'ah or growth. And so Allah, in relation to creation, He is Rabb. Because everything in the world is from His rububiyyah. Even the reason we're here. So much went into creating you. It's amazing what your parents and all their previous and coming together and nine months in your mother's womb with amazing, I mean, if you look at the mitotic cell division, all these things that are going on with the human being, there's an immense amount of, uh, of the power, the divine power that's manifesting in creation, always, constantly. So, ilm al And the second one is nabuwa. It relates to prophets who are in direct communication, direct through angels and things like that. But they're, they're, all of us can communicate with our Lord. And there are signs, but we don't have direct access in the way that we can just simply understand what exactly God is telling us. I mean, how many times have things happened to you and you want to know, what is God trying to tell me? I mean, that's... He's, everything that happens to you is to tell you something, but he's left it to us to try to work it out. But with the prophets, they tell us. And, and they give us this direct, so that we can really understand what is being uh, expected from our Lord and what, what he wants from us. So the nubuwa, and then the ma'ad. So ma'ad is those things, es eschatology, in, in, if you want a big 50 cent word, for things that happen in, in the next life. The ma'ad is when we go back to Allah and those things that are going to happen in the akhirah. And then the ahkam, which are the legal rulings, the injunctions. There are ahkam in the Quran. There's awamr and nawahi, uh, injunctions and prohibitions. And then the wa'ad and the wa'id. And you have to be careful of this because wa'ad is used for wa'id in the Quran. You, but, but there is a difference and it's an important distinction because something a lot of Muslims don't know, and I, yeah, you know, I don't know if the ulama don't tell people these things because they don't want them to misuse them or abuse them, but I always find these things fascinating. Um, and one of them is about the wa'id, but I'm not going to tell you because you have to study to find this stuff out. But, uh, what's that? I'm give this targhib for learning. 
So the, uh, the wa'ad is God's promise and the wa'id is his threat. That Allah threatens us. Do this and I'll give you this. Do this and I'll do this to you. So the wa'id is the threat from Allah. And then finally the qasas. So they're the stories. Now the Quran, all of the verses in the Quran relate to one of these seven things. The Fatiha contains all seven. And this is why the Fatiha is a summation of all the meanings of Quran. The reason Yasin is called Qalb al-Quran is because it focuses on the base, the, the three essential aspects of the religion that relate to belief. The heart is the place of belief. And the Quran, the three central meanings of Yasin are Uluhiyat, Allah, the Rububiya, the, the Nubuwa, and the Ma'ad. Those, those are the three central focuses, and those relate to Aqa'id, to our beliefs, what's in our heart. And that's why it's Qalb al Quran. Yasin is Qalb al Quran because it's about, and that's why it's traditionally was read. The, the hadith is, is a good hadith. I mean, Imam Ahmad relates it, Nasai, Tirmidhi. Uh, you know, there's some weakness in the chain. There's ittirab in the chain and things like this. But one of the madnesses of modern Muslims is this idea of throwing out all the weak hadith. And in the history of Islam, nobody did this. There's no doubt that there's problems with the hadith literature. There's probabilities of... Uh, hadith in even the soundest collections that are not 100%. But you don't throw them out. So the weak hadith, especially if the, 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 the ulama, you know, in, you know, saw good in the meaning and encouraged it. Because fadail al-amal, the virtuous actions, you can use weak hadith. We don't use weak hadith for uh, what's called ahkam or aqaid you know, for, for belief type things. But for fadail al-amal, for doing virtuous actions, they're used. And Imam Ahmad in his usul uses weak hadith, which are really hasan hadith. They're less than sahih. He uses them in ahkam. He preferred that over the opinions of men. But there are many weak hadith about Yasin, which indicates, I mean, I've, in, in, uh, I, I did a translation of, the collections of the Prophet and for people from the modern world so they can understand this, weak hadiths are like C and D in a grading. You don't throw them out. You just don't use them as your example before the class, right? But they're, they're not rejected. That's called F, which is moldua. F fabricated gets F. Now, there are weak hadiths that get D minus. They're still not thrown out because the probability that the Prophet ﷺ said it is still there. So you can't just throw it out because there is a probability that he said it. It's just the probability is not, it's like 70% as opposed to 95%, which is a lot of the hadiths that are ahad in al-Bukhari or Muslim or you know they get like 98, 99 the only hadith that gets 100% is mutawatir hadith like the qira'at um, the, the sheikh that recited for us at the beginning of this uh, learned the 10 qira'at why 10? 7 are mutawatira the, the 3 that are called ahad are still good qira'at they're just not mutawatira. So you don't just throw them out. You still learn them. But we recite in canonical prayer, we recite with the qira'at. But in teaching and in other things, they use the ahad and even the shad in Arabic. There are shad qira'at that are still learned because the Arabic is sound and there's meanings in them. But they're not, it's not permitted to use them in prayer or for any canonical purpose. But, but they're, they're just not thrown out. So it's important to note that uh, because it's a big problem. So rububiya is ithbat wujud al-bari. It's what istidlal alayhi bi makhluqatihi. So 
the, the verses that deal with this are to let you know that Allah is, is the one who brought the world into existence and the proof for his existence is through his creation. The word in Arabic, alam, is called uh, ismu ala. It's, it's, it's a type of noun which is called the noun of instrument, like tabi'. You know, a tabi' is something you print things with. Alam is something that you know things with. So the alam is the way that you know your Lord. So, ilm al rububiyyah comes from the world. The way you know, when, when Allah says, yasma wa yara, that He hears and He sees, how do we know that? How do we know what that means? Because we can see in here, walaysa kamithrihi shay. Nothing's like God. Wa huwa sami' al basir. And yet, see that wow is isti'naf. It's not. You know, it's literally like it's saying, and yet, nothing is like him, and yet, despite nothing in the world being like Allah, he hears and he sees. Not like you hear and you see, but the only way you could even understand what that means is because you have hearing and seeing. Nothing is like Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that in the Quran. Allah is telling us that there, these, through these verses that Allah has this rububiyyah in the world. And, and that's the way we understand it. It's through the alam. It's through the creation. So all these verses about winds moving. I mean, you read these about trees and looking at looking at the camel and how it's created. All those are to tell you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He is the Rabbul Alameen. And then the Nabuwa is to affirm, assert that the prophets are true. And especially the prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad because it's the one that's relevant for us. The, the previous ones were true, but they're, they're, no, it's, 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 they're no longer, uh, they're abrogated basically. I mean, that, that's the proper word for it. They're, the the sharaya alati sabakat al Islam nusikhat. They've been abrogated. We believe that. There is a some Muslims, I mean very small group, but there are some Muslims that say that religions are valid, you know, that still other religions. We we don't say that. That's not an orthodox uh, doctrine and, and we have to assert that Islam abrogates previous dispensations. But I would add to that, and I think it's important to note, that there is a wisdom, without a doubt, why Allah has maintained the world as it is. And if you lose sight of that wisdom, you can become very arrogant about your own position. Because Muslims fall into the chosen people syndrome. Right? When the reality of it is, most of you are Muslim because you were born Muslim. You didn't even choose. It was just given to you. You know, there's some of us, it actually was a struggle to find it. But it was still a gift. I mean, I see it as a gift to even converts. But still, there was a process that you had to go through. You didn't know certain things. So it's very important to maintain humility with your faith. But it's a great blessing to be from a tradition of the prophets, but... It's the greatest blessing to be from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu irrespective of whatever is happening to the Muslims. Because the people of truth are often clobbered. I mean, that, that, in fact, when Allah loves you and you're disobeying Him, He usually clobbers you as a way of, of getting you close to Him. I mean, that's one of the ways. And that's why you can't judge people, oh, they're getting what they deserve. No, they might be getting what... Allah wants them to get in order to get close to them and you're the one that's not getting what you deserve. <laughs> People don't think about that, but that, that's, that's a reality. So, how, how much time left? Okay. So, the, the next is the, uh, the ma'a. And then they have karamat. The prophets have these, these miracles. The next is the ma'ad, which is ithbat al-hashar. And then 
that Allah establishes Yom Qiyamah, that we will be raised up. Iqamat al-Barahin, proving that. You know, one of the things about uh, Imam al-Farabi, uh, he was the Imam of the logicians, um, Abu al-Faraj al-Farabi, and he, he was uh, very brilliant. Uh, they say he spoke over 70 languages. Allahu I, I knew I knew somebody who's, who spoke uh, 28 languages, so... Uh, I, I couldn't, and I w once asked Dr. Omar how many languages he knew, and he said, living or dead, you know, so, so there are people that do learn lots of languages easily. I was told that if you master three, you can crack the code, and then it just gets easy, um, but the, he once, he, they call him a mu'allim al-thani, which is the second teacher, the first teacher in logic, not anything else. This, the first teacher was Aristotle. That's what the Arabs called him. Um, but he said, I wish that uh, Arist I could meet Aristotle to ask him what he thought of من يحيلي you know, who will bring the bones back to life uh, after they've gone to dust. قُدْ يُحْيِيهَا الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا Say, he will bring them back to life, the one who brought them to life the first time. And Farabi just thought that was the most brilliant, logical proof. It's called an enthymeme, where you exclude, you have a minor, major premise, and then you have the conclusion. So you exclude uh, the, the, one of the premises, and you come to the conclusion without showing the full logic of it because of the intuitive understanding of it. But anyway... He, he, the, what, what, what he was saying there was that what God is saying really is whoever can create a thing one time can do it a second time. God created things one time so he can redo it a second time. So that's his proof for resurrection. It's like it was a perfect logical uh, soliloquistic proof as far as that Farabi was concerned. So the Ma'ad... The Qur'an deals with the Ma'ad, and one of the most interesting things about the pre-Islamic Arabs is they didn't believe in the Ma'ad. All, all the people around the world believed in afterlife, but Arabs didn't believe in afterlife. They thought that this was it. And they actually believed that khulud was the immortality of a person was through poetry. And so shahama in the Arabic language it's being concerned about things that will be remembered for a long time. So the shaham amongst the Arabs was the one that wanted to be remembered by doing great deeds so that he, his praises would be sung by poets. But they didn't believe in Abbas. So it's quite extraordinary that the Prophet ﷺ and the Quran, that he came with this knowledge to the Arabs, but that he convinced them in 23 years. I mean, it's amazing that, that the Prophet ﷺ, it's a proof of how powerful this was for a people that did not believe in the Ma'ad, and within 23 years, all of them believed in it with great certainty. And obviously, the proofs in the Qur'an, there's two major proofs, which is the agricultural proof of just looking at land brought back to life after it's dead with water, but also the embryological proof which is in Surah Al-Hajj, if you look at the two proofs, the embryological proof is a modern man's proof. And now we have cloning, which is amazing. Because cloning, you know, a nashat al-ula is the normal type. وَقَدْ عَلِمْتُمْ nashatul ula You knew the first way that you're going to be, that you were created. But there's a second way that you can be recreated. And it's from one the Prophet said that, that, that Allah would recreate everybody from an indestructible seed that is in every human being. And they're going to be brought back to life from that indestructible seed, which some say is at the base of the coccyx, but Allahu Alam. But the point is, is that we now know theoretically that somebody can be recreated from one small it's amazing that they're coming up with this knowledge. It's going to become clear to them that this is true. How did the Prophet know that? That there was a little seed that the whole of the human being could be recreated from. 
So the ma'ad is very important. There are many verses. And then the ahkam are uh, awamir wa nawahi, commands and prohibitions. And they have five types. You have wajib, mandub, mubah, makru, and haram. So those are, everything can be categorized under one of those five things. But you also have in the ahkam, and this is important, you have ahkam that relate to the body, like praying and fasting relate to the body, but you also have ahkam that relate to the heart. And we forget this, that the Qur'an tells us about having khushu'a, about purifying our hearts. These are also prohibitions and injunctions. You're, you are required to work on purifying your heart. You are required not to have pride. Pride is haram. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever enters into, uh, nobody will enter into paradise if they have a mustard seed's weight of pride in their hearts. He said, Umirtu an atawada hatta la yafkhara ahadun ala ahad. Aw la yabghiya ahadun ala ahad. I was commanded to be humble. Tawada'u ya ibad Allah. Be humble. So pride, all these things, this is a, an important aspect of the Qur'an. Ikhlas. Having ikhlas to Allah. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ They were only commanded Allah. They were only commanded to worship Allah sincerely. مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ And the religion is only for Him. Everything you do is only for Allah. So having riya in your heart, doing things so that other people say this, that, or the other about you. And then the wa'ad is the promise of the good of the dunya and the akhira. رَبَّنَا أَتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِينَ عَذَابَ النَّارِ Having good in this world. Victory is promised from Allah. If you obey Allah, if you do what Allah tells you, He will, he will and He'll also, He can stop people from attacking you. He, he kaffa aidihum ankum. Bibatni Mekkata. He stops some people from harming you in that valley in Mecca. He's reminding the Sahaba, don't you remember when they could have caused you harm? Allah stopped them. Allah can stop people from doing harm. He, wallahi, He can pull all these troops out. Allah does everything. All of the hearts are between, and this is anthropomorphic language, but obviously we understand it to be ma qadrullah haqqa qadrihi. They didn't estimate Allah with true estimation. But it says that the hearts are between the fingers of the merciful. And the heart is how is it made supple? With dhikr of Allah. The heart should be, if it's supple, then it will be molded by the fingers of the Rahman. Allah will mold your heart. But if your heart becomes hard, if there's qasawa, qasat qulubuhum, their hearts become hard, then it's broken, it's crushed by Allah. That's what happens. So your heart should be supple so that it's molded to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not in this state of harshness in which it's what is a kamithrihi shay. Nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then finally the wa'id, which is the warning of being, and it's iqab in dunya and akhira, khizyun. You will have humiliation in this world if you disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now people can say, well, why do the kuffar, you know, there's people that, are not worshiping Allah and they have all this izza and they, it's not real izza, it's worldly izza. On Yom Qiyamah, everything gets switched around. Tyrants are raised up like ants in the akhira. They're crushed by people. They're insignificant people. So the dunya, if you use the ma'yar or the standard of this world, you can become deluded about our place in this world. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. And then finally, the qasas. Uh, are the akhbar of the prophets uh, in the Quran, all the stories, and it's important. And also the stories of the righteous, like Luqman al-Hakim and the people of uh, Ahl al-Kahf. There's, there's wisdom in their stories. There's things to learn. And also the stories of the destroyed people and why they were destroyed. Because we learn through stories. We learn through narrations. Um, and then humans are also attracted by stories. I mean, one of the things that some of the 
uh, Sahaba said to the Prophet, because the Jews had said, oh, we have stories in our book. You don't have, you know. And, and, and if you look at Surat Yusuf, Surat Yusuf came down. It's the only surah that is similar to the Bible in its narrative uh, form. And one of the reasons for that is to show people who criticize the Quran for not being like other books that if Allah wanted to, he's already done that. If he wanted to make it like the Bible, he would have just revised the Bible. But this is a new message. And it's for the last people. And so it has all of the elements that are, that are useful to the last people uh, in it. And, uh, and then finally, I'm going to quickly go uh, over, and I'll end here, um, that... The Ibn Juzay identifies 12 sciences. The Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever speaks about the Quran from his opinion is wrong even if he's right. And one of the things that the ulama traditionally were uh, terrified of doing was uh, commenting on what the Quran means. Because you're arrogating to yourself an understanding of what Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala is saying to his creation, which is incredibly dangerous thing to do. But many of the ulama understood that hadith to mean if you did not have the adawat, the tools of understanding the Qur'an, then you shouldn't speak about the Qur'an. There's, there's 12 that he identifies. The first is tafsir itself. That you know that the tafsir, there's a difference between tafsir and ta'wil. Some of the ulama say that they're the same, and others say that tafsir is the outward meaning of the, the actual mebna. So you have like... Uh, you know, uh, inna is a, is a type of, uh, you know, a, a tool in the Arabic language that, that's used for emphasis, all right? It's for tawkid. And so that's, you understand what that means, the tafsir. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, innaka lamin al mursaleen, you know that it's emphasizing that. And then the lamb there is also to even create a stronger emphasis. Or that it's, uh, you know, it's, you also know that it's uh, jawab qasam, Something like that. I mean, those are the tools that you need to understand. Uh, fasr in Arabic is, just means kashf. It means to unveil something. To, and one of the things Imam Ali said about Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, is he said, يُفَسِّرُ الْقُرْآنِ كَأَنَّهُ يَنْظُرُ إِلَى الْغَيْبِ مِنْ وَرَأِي سَتَارٍ رَقِيقٍ He interprets the Qur'an as if he's looking at the unseen through a gauze fabric. And that's how amazing Ibn Abbas's understanding of the Qur'an because the Prophet ﷺ made that dua for him. So, tafsir. And then the qira'at. You should know the qira'at. For instance, in, in Yasin it says, Tanzil al-Aziz al-Hakim, which is mansub. And then it says in Warsh, which was read tonight, Tanzil al-Aziz al-Hakim, which is marfu'ah. So if you don't know that there's more than one way to read that, because in one, it could be mubtada, it could be khabar of uh, mubtada mahdhuf. In the other, it, it could be, um, you know, it could be mansub lil masdariya because it's saying anzalahu tanzilan or something like that. So it's mansub al masdar. There's different, if you don't know the qiraat, then you can make mistakes. And that's why you have to know qiraat or you'll go astray. In, in interpreting the Qur'an. And then you have to know the ahkam. So you have to know that there's rules in the Qur'an. There, there are verses that are abrogated. There's verses... Uh, and then naskh, which is abrogation. Like the Qur'an, you know, you don't put the woman in the house until she dies. Right? That's abrogated. So you have to know those things because there's verses in the Qur'an that don't have applicability. And then the hadith. Because if the Prophet said something about a verse and we're fortunate... And I say fortunate because the Prophet did this for our benefit. We are fortunate that the Prophet did not. He did it as a mercy to us in enabling the Quran to be interpreted in many, many different ways. Because had the Prophet said this is what the verse meant, nobody could ever dare say it meant anything else. And so the Prophet ﷺ, as a mercy to us, 
it's very limited what he actually spoke about the Qur'an. Now, one could say, well, he would have solved all the problems. That's true. But it's for this honoring human beings and their intellect and giving them the ability to think for themselves and not have everything spelled out for them. It's a great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's one of the blessings that the Prophet said. He said, Mawti khayru lakum. Right? Tuhdithuna fayuhdatha lakum. You know, my death is good for you. I mean, the greatest musibah of our ummah was his death. But he said, my death is good for you. Because you do things and rulings come down. If I stayed with you, those rulings would keep coming down until you couldn't do them all. So the fact that the revelation stopped was a blessing to people because it would have gotten too much. So, and then uh, Al-Qasas, knowing the stories of the prophets, like in Habib al-Najjar, in the... In the, in the uh, uh, the, the Surat Yasin, there's a story in there, so to know that story. Tasawwuf, which we could go on a long thing of what that means, but basically it's about taskiya, tasfiya, uh, purification of the heart, and then usul al din aqidah, usul al fiqh, which is understanding, especially language, like al amr yadullu ala al wujub adatan, that if a command comes in the Quran, it's for an obligation normally. Sometimes it's not like kulu wa sharabu wa tusirifu, eat and drink but not to excess. It's not haram to eat every once in a while to have your full, but generally it's makru to do that. You know, so there's things like that, uh, even though that's a command. And then logha, logha al-arabiya, to know the language, to know, uh, you know the marfu'at, the mansubat, the majrurat, to know the ishtiqaqat, to know the basic sarf, uh, of, of the, the Qur'an. And then uh, al-bayan, which is balagha, which is ma'ani, to know uh, badi'a, ilm al-badi'a, which is muhassinat al logha how the logha embellishes itself, uh, to know uh, the, the rhetorical devices, isti'ara, to know what majaz is, kinaya, uh, you know, these, these type things, tibaq, iltifat, uh, understanding those things. So these are all the tools um, and now there's people that think, oh, they can just talk about the Qur'an without having studied any of this stuff. And it's a disaster. Because, uh, you know, you can really get yourself into trouble. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, reward all of you and um, reward, inshallah, the people that uh, have been behind this uh, Medina Institute. Uh, and inshallah, uh, I hope you have a blessed time uh, during you know, these lessons, uh, really good people that we have here. So, subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika, ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk. Alhamdulillah. Allahumma wafaq al-Islam al-Muslimin. Allahumma wafaqna fi islamina ya arham al-Rahimin. Allahumma saddad khutana la ilaha illa anta subhanak. Allahumma hawan alina fi hadhi al-ayyam. المصائب التي نزلت في تكسيس اللهم لا ترد علينا ردودا سيئة على المسلمين في أمريكا وفي غيرها يا رحم الراحمين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المسلمين والحمد لله رب العالمين